Our next speaker is Stan Chen, who worked under Mr. Jesse Jennison, and he will speak on the rank number of grid graphs. All right, so our object of interest in this study is what is called graph labeling. A graph labeling is a function that takes the set of vertices of a graph to a set of integers. One of the most famous graph labeling problems is the graph coloring problem. This asks, how can you label the vertices of a graph with colors so that no two adjacent edges, or no two adjacent vertices will share the same color? Now, a problem related to this, which will be the object of our talk, is called graph ranking. Now, graph ranking, rather than labeling the vertices with colors, will label the vertices with different integer labels so that between any two vertices with the same label, each path will contain a vertex with a bigger label. So for example, if we take this four by eight graph, you can see that if we connect any two vertices with the same label, with any path, it'll always contain a bigger number. This is called a graph ranking. Now, an obvious question that we can ask is, what is the least number of integer labels we need in order for this ranking condition to be satisfied? So it turns out that even for grid graphs, this problem is actually considerably hard. So previously, the rank number has been completely characterized for 1 by n, 2 by n, and 3 by n grid graphs. The logic for a 1 by n grid graph is relatively simple. We have one biggest label, which obviously is going to be unique. So let's put it optimally in the center. What happens when we cut out that middle vertex? Then, we're, well, then we end up with two grid graphs with the following dimensions. So that gives us our recursive term. And then we have the one that represents the high number. The logic for a 2 by n grid graph is relatively similar. Again, we have these two high vertices in the middle that once we cut out, we're left with a subgraph of the following dimensions. And you can see that it's essentially a 2 by a uh, certain number of columns grid, except you're left with this appendage um, that is you know, still relatively easy to work with. It gets significantly harder, however, as you progress in terms of the number of rows. For a 3 by n, once you cut out these middle vertices, you're actually left with this L-shaped configuration um, that turns out to be uh, much harder to deal with. But in the end, the rank number um, has been found to still confirm to this pattern of three more than this recursive term, with a few exceptions, in which case it's actually four more. But overall, you can see a recurring theme that the idea of cutting a grid in half into smaller sections and working with those will be a key idea in how we deal with the rank number for four by n. Now, the rank number 4 by n has actually been previously unknown. Here, I'll present a proof of um, a completely characterized function for it. So to begin, we're going to find a tight lower bound, a tight upper bound, and then we're going to use some big ideas and casework in order to completely resolve it into an explicit function. So for the lower bound, notice that um, we have these few terms here. Uh, we're going to define the largest color that is used more than once to be alpha, and the smallest subset of all the vertices labeled with integers bigger than alpha to be the cut set, C. So for example, if we take this graph, you see that 6 is going to be the number that's used more than once, and it's also the biggest such number. And the cut set is going to be the set of integers bigger than 6, so that once you take these cut set vertices out, you're left with two halves of the graph, each of which will contain alpha. It turns out that alpha, um, when, you, when you have the cut set, it'll actually be at least four vertices. And once you remove it, you'll always get a grid graph with the following dimensions. You'll notice that we'll have these middle four vertices and then the rank number of whatever this grid graph is. Um, and this gives us our lower bound. To find our upper bound, we define a sticky end to be this bolded configuration uh, resembling somewhat of a staircase. Um, it turns out that if we combine two copies of a four by n grid, each with two sticky ends, and then we merge them in the middle with two high vertices, obviously the, the path condition will still be satisfied. Furthermore, this actually yields a 4 by 2n plus 4 grid graph with two sticky ends. So this kind of iterative construction actually gives us an upper bound. And once we combine our lower bound and our upper bound, we're, what, we're left with um, this staircase-like um, stair-step uh, bound. So you'll see that in each interval in which n resides, the rank number of 4 by n grid will be nestled between two consecutive integers. Now we're going to proceed using two strong lemmas and a bit of casework in order to find in each interval where the rank number will progress from the lower bound to the upper bound. So first, we have what's called the, corner, the cut lemma. The cut lemma states that given any configuration of cuts at vertices, 
Once you remove them, you're left with two halves, one of which will have to have a grid graph with the following dimensions, except it'll be missing a corner. On that note, we also have the corner lemma. And the corner lemma states that for a sufficiently long grid, removing the corner will actually not affect the rank number. It'll stay the same. In this way, we can completely characterize the rank number uh, to be the following function. So at these intervals, the rank number will jump from the lower bound to the upper bound. It actually resolves quite nicely to this uh, beautiful recursive um, definition. Um, but again, you'll see that in certain cases, just like for 3IN, there will be a few exceptions, in which case it'll actually be five more rather than four more than this recursive term. Next, I'll present my uh, uh, second result, which is an improved upper bound for the rank number of grid graphs in general. So previously, the rank number for these general grid graphs has been bounded so that you're actually cutting the vertices in the middle in this one column and leave behind two subgrids um, roughly of half the dimensions of the previous general grid. So this gives uh, the following upper bound. We're going to introduce the concept of a triangle grid. It turns out that we can find the upper bound of a triangle grid using uh, construction, and we actually get this as its explicit form. Now, rather than taking a straight up cut in the middle column, we're going to take a cut diagonally. This leaves behind a subgrid shown here, and a triangle grid, and then we have these high vertices. Now, if we add the rank number of the subgrid to the rank number of the triangle grid, and then add it to the number of cut set vertices, we actually get the following upper bound. And if we make both these explicit and plot them, um, we can actually get that it turns out that our upper bound is significantly better than the previous upper bound for rectangular grids whose dimensions are sufficiently close. Here you'll see in blue our new upper bound, and the teal upper bound is the previous upper bound. And it turns out that when you have n columns, when n is less than some number on the order of the number of rows to the power of three halves, our bound is significantly better. Now I'll present my final result, an improved lower bound on square grid graphs rank numbers. To do this, I'm going to prove that if I cut out any at least m vertices from the middle, I'm going to split it into two subgraphs, one of which will contain a square grid of the following dimensions. Um, so roughly two-fifths of the size of the original grid. To do this, I'm going to first prove that we only need diagonal cut paths. This is a diagonal cut path in which the cut set vertices will essentially bounce off the left and rightmost columns. It turns out that if you have any deviation from this cut path, it's not going to be optimal because the subgraph induced will actually contain the vertices shown bolded here that are induced by a diagonal cut path. So the diagonal cut path is optimal. Next, I'm going to show the set of subgrids that are guaranteed to exist for a diagonal cut path. Indeed, once you cut off the middle columns, you're going to split into two halves, one of which will be this grid. Also, you'll have a subgrid that's nestled between the two endpoints of the cut path. You're going to have, um, once you extend the rightmost column by one unit, you see it's still going to be nestled between the cut path. And we can apply this extension um, until we reach here. And this gives us an entire family of subgrids, which I am able to prove with a bit of algebra will actually contain the recursive term, the two-fifths of the square um, that we're looking for. Next, um, what happens if we have more than n vertices in the cut set? Well, if that's the case, uh, I'm going to show that anything that you can do with more than n vertices, you can do with only n vertices. So n vertices will still be optimal. I can show that any cut set, I only need to consider when the cut neighbors are actually in different columns. Using this logic, I'm able to prove that if you add d extra vertices to the cut set, then you're going to actually remove at most d vertices from each subgrid that is guaranteed to exist. So I'll just illustrate this with an example. So let's start with our diagonal cut path, and let's deform it by adding three extra vertices. I'm going to show that each subgrid induced by this diagonal cut path will be missing at most three vertices when you cut out this uh, deformed cut path. So I will highlight all the vertices that are uh, missing in red. Um, you can see here that as you move forward, each, in each row you're going to lose one vertex, but in each new column you're going to gain one. So if we keep extending this, your net change is going to be one. Uh, it's going to be at most three. So ultimately, we've proven that if we rewrite our lower bound explicitly, we get the following linear function. Notice here, this is the current upper bound, and the previous lower bound for square grids was logarithmic. This is our new lower bound. Um, it turns out that a corollary of this is that because triangle grids will contain squares um, roughly of this size, we can actually bound the triangle grid 
uh, rank number to, below, uh, to above a linear function as well, um, which is significantly better than the old lower bound. So in conclusion, we found the exact rank number value for four by n grids. We've improved the upper bound for general grids, and we've improved the lower bound for both square grid graphs and triangle grid graphs. This has applications in finding minimal separators of graphs, which can be applied to VLSI circuit layouts and a variety of parallel algorithms. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank my mentor, Jesse Jennison. I'd like to thank CERSI and MIT for giving me this amazing opportunity to do research. Uh, Dr. Jake Wildstrom for his excellent tutorship. Um, Dr. Tanya Kavanova for um, allowing me to see the bigger picture while working on my project. Uh, Dr. Professor Jerison and the MIT Math Department for putting this all together. Um, Dr. Kartik Venkatram for showing me a really neat um, expression for the rank number for four by n grid graphs. Um, Brian, Martin, Randy, Akil, and Jody for editing my paper and helping me on presentation. And um, my sponsors, Akamai Technologies and the Hipson family, and everyone here for um, listening to my presentation. Thank you. Um, there's a duality between vertices and edges that you can, ex you can invert them and express them. Have you like taken a look at uh, what that, what would do your methods look like under that and, and any insights from that? Okay, so the question was, can you extend this vertex ranking problem to edges? Well, it turns out, actually, that it was originally motivated by the edge ranking problem, not the vertex ranking problem, but obviously because uh, the, any graph in which you're doing an edge ranking corresponds to graph, the line graph for a vertex ranking. Um, it's essentially similar. We can just um, you know, map them. But edge ranking was originally inspired, inspired by the fact that, um, like I said, um, there are a variety of parallel algorithms that um, this project applies to. So it's, let's say you want to schedule uh, an assembly of some complex product in an industrial system. So we can actually map, we can actually represent that product as a graph, um, where edges will represent connections where you want to put together two parts. Well, it turns out that if we label the edges so we have an edge ranking, then the label of each edge will represent the step at which you're going to join that edge. So in this way, if we find the edge rank number, then we can actually find the least number of steps we need to construct a product in parallel. Uh, Professor Shaw? Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can explain the construction for the triangular graphs, or at least give us some uh, hint for why it's much easier to solve the triangular compared to the triangular graph. Okay, so the question was, um, why is the triangular um, lower bound um, so much easier to find than the general grid? So it turns out that when you have a triangle grid, you know that you're always going to have this central grid that's like the, the base of the triangle. Um, because this base is a subgraph of the triangle, then once we find a lower bound for this, then we have a lower bound for this. And, uh, we can just plug in, because we know, we know, based on the dimensions of the triangle, that this is going to be roughly on the order of half of the triangle's dimensions. We can just plug that into uh, this equation in order to get this equation. Professor Fox? Uh, can you tell me a little more about the history of why uh, the motivation behind studying this particular problem and why for rank number for grid graphs? Uh, sure, OK. Um, so he's uh, asking, what is the motivation behind the vertex ranking problem, and why grid graphs? So originally, like I said, um, this has applications in VLI, VLSI circuits. Um, what a VLSI circuit is, it's like a chip with a lot of layers um, and a large number of transistors and wires. So we're just going to represent that as vertices uh, for the transistors and edges for the wires. Uh, this problem was originally studied because um, there's this way of making the area of a VLSI circuit optimal, um, because area is related to hardware expense, um, so that um, there's this thing called the divide and conquer paradigm, and that directly correlates to the, um, to the cut set idea um, in finding minimal separators. Um, it turns out that if you have uh, a VLSI design with n vertices, then you're always going to have a separator of, at most, square root of n vertices, so that you'll split it right in half. Well, in this case, the hard part is actually finding what that separator is. Um, so that concept of having these big numbers to separate the graph um, really motivated the vertex ranking problem. And you also asked, why square grids? Well, it turns out that it's very easy, actually, to make, uh, well, it's very intuitive um, to design a VLSI circuit layout in terms of a square. Um, furthermore, you can see that for a square, we've shown 
um, that and an optimal cut set will be of m vertices. Well, the square has m squared vertices. So again, that shows that the cut set is actually optimal because we know if you have n vertices in a graph, the square root of n vertices um, will be the optimal cut set. Uh, Dr. Baganoff? Um, so you have a, a lot of results here. Can you explain for one or two of them methods that you tried to, to produce your result, your proof, that didn't work? Okay. Um, well, one of the harder parts, um, oh yeah, sorry. Okay. So the, the question was, um, what methods did I attempt that did not work? Well, it turns out that this idea of a corner lemma um, of removing vertices, um, or removing corners from a grid graph will preserve the rank number. It's actually intuitively obvious, um, but it was extraordinarily hard to prove. And it turned out that for small cases of graphs, it actually didn't work. Um, so the basic idea behind this is that um, if you're going to have a graph missing a corner that has the same rank number, that means that you can color the vertices of that graph um, with the corner so that the biggest number is going to be in that corner. So once you take it off, we're just pretty much ignoring it. Um, it turns out that for smaller grids, however, the cut set will actually uh, contain um, a vertex in the corner. Um, so this corner lemma actually doesn't hold, because one of the high vertices is going to be in the corner. So in order to resolve that, I actually had to um, construct um, ways of making big grids out of small grids um, that didn't necessarily use the corner lemma. Dr. Sapansky? So you mentioned this corner lemma was that if you removed a vertex in a corner, that the rank was still going to be the same. What, do you have any idea of what would happen if you just remove arbitrary vertices? Is there any pattern to what happens in those situations? Sure. OK, so the question was, uh, what happens when you remove any vertex from the grid graph? Well, it turns out that the rank number, although it's pretty hard to find, it has this monotonicity property so that if you remove any vertex, the rank number is obviously going to drop by at most one. Because um, obviously, if you have a ranking, um, let's just make that, uh, that one vertex you're going to remove be the highest number. Once you remove that highest number, everything else could be one, uh, at most one less than that high number. So we know that the new rank number is going to be bounded below by just one less. Um, but it depends where the vertex is in the grid graph. Um, so in terms of like connectivity, um, number of uh, the degree of the vertex, um, and that will affect whether or not the rank number will go down or stay the same. Mr. Katowicz? Uh You've established upper and lower bounds that were improvements on existing bounds. Uh, did you do any empirical testing to find what the actual numbers are for a set of cases and maybe to use that for insights into further refinements of the upper and lower bounds? Um, well, oh yeah. <laughs> OK, um, so the question was, did I do any empirical testing to see if I could refine the lower bound? Well, it turns out that for, let's go back to the upper bound. So the upper bound um, turns out to be, um, I showed empirically that for um, certain graphs uh, that are you know, sufficiently long, that removing any cut set will actually um, not necessarily be as good as um, just cutting straight down. Um, because, you see, if you're removing m vertices, um, you're removing at most m columns, right, if you just have a diagonal. In the end, if you have a very long grid, it turns out that removing m vertices in each iteration isn't going to be as good as removing one. So I actually found um, this bound um, to be the set of um, numbers for n, so that an m by n grid is um, bounded better using our bound. So that's the empirical part. Are there any other questions from our judges? Let's thank Stan. <laughs>